Oh, hey. Hi, I'm Janice Reed, Vice President of Umpqua Watersheds. Thank you for joining us for the 25th Annual Umpqua Watersheds Banquet. Last year at this time, we were all making the transition to virtual meetings and events due to the seriousness of the pandemic. Our banquet last year was held virtually. Today, we're closer to in-person events and meetings, but we're still not there. So once again, we're conducting our banquet via video. We feel it's important that we continue to get our members, give our members updates on the activities, events, and committees, and community interaction. The pandemic did not stop the degradation of our forests, water, and wildlife habitat. Saving the earth takes constant effort. Ooh, nice glass. I'm going to do a little Rubio here. If you've traveled the world, either virtually or in person, you know that Clean water and clean air cannot be taken for granted. We really need to continue to engage our community members and our leaders. Umpqua Watershed did not hit the pause button this last year. And thanks to you and your generosity, we have been able to continue to participate in restoration efforts, comment on legislation and federal regulations, engage youth in the community, with our education projects, conduct a few hikes and some river cleanup activities, advocate for the Crater Lake Wilderness Protection, and engage the community through our radio station that has grown. Today, we're going to give you some updates on what we've been doing this past year. Not everything, of course, because that would take quite a bit of time, but we have been busy. First, I'd like to thank our office manager, Melanie McKinnon, our secretary, Diana Pace, our bookkeeper, Diana Stone Larson, and our treasurer, Mark Eason, who, by the way, is very instrumental in the facility management committee. After the committee presentations, you will hear an update from our president, Ken Carloni, and some award presentations. Then you'll hear from the Bureau of Land Management's Roseburg Field Office fisheries biologist, Jeff McEnroe on the restoration efforts in the Archie Creek Fire area. So stay tuned, we'll be back. Hello everyone, I'm Angela Jensen. I'm the Conservation and Legal Director for Omqua Watersheds. I'm here this evening to talk to you about our conservation efforts. First, we're just gonna do some updates. Last year, Diana Pace informed you of a memorandum of understanding, a brokered agreement between Governor Brown, Timber and Conservation Groups to negotiate terms to modernize the Oregon Forest Practices Act according to the best available and most current science. I'm here to let you know that talks remain ongoing, but we are very hopeful and that we, and that we, remain, that we will have an agreement to submit to the legislature very soon. We have continued to monitor and provide testimony on the Elliott State Research Forest, and we are very hopeful that Oregon State University will have a final proposal for the Oregon Department of State Lands very soon. Hopes remain high that the proposal will include details of riparian, on riparian protections, the breadth and scope of anticipated research in the forest, and most importantly, a proper governance structure that will ensure accountability to the public. Concerning the Blue and Gold Harvest Plan, Patty Quinn and Janice Reed both submitted comments last July, and additional comments were accepted after the comment period deadline due to last year's wildfires. So we submitted comments related to the possible cumulative impacts in light of those wildfire events last year. Much of the work our conservation committee does involves sister organizations as we work within the Pacific Northwest Forest Climate Alliance and the Forest Waters Coalition. Among our many focuses is Governor Brown's Oregon Climate Action Plan, or otherwise known as Executive Order 2004, which directs state agencies to consider climate change and emissions reduction goals in policy and decision-making processes. We have worked very hard to support and encourage the implementation of this executive order by providing written testimony to both Oregon Department of Forestry and the Oregon Global Warming Commission. 
We have also signed on to the Green New Deal for the Pacific Northwest. While still in its infancy, this is the idea that we can have stable rural economies and respectable standards of living in our rural communities without sacrificing our forest ecosystems to industrial logging. We will continue to work forward in this effort as well. We have also engaged the Biden administration with letters imploring the protection of federal forests in the Pacific Northwest for purposes of climate mitigation and carbon storage to be calculated into our nationally determined contribution commitments under the International Paris Climate Agreement. Last fall, the U U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service issued a proposed rule change that would exclude more than 204,000 acres among 10 counties in Oregon from critical habitat designation for the Northern Spotted Owl. Janice Reed, a critical member of our conservation committee and wildlife biologist with years of experience with spotted owls, submitted comments showing that any decrease in critical habitat could jeopardize the existence of the species. I am very grateful for her work. We also submitted comments detailing how the reasoning behind the proposed rule was legally flawed and would likely lead to legal challenges in court. We have since received notice that the agency, from the agency that due to the threat of legal challenge, among other things, the implementation of the rule has been postponed. The agency invited further comment, and of course, we accepted that invitation and provided further comment imploring the use of sound science to protect the iconic species and its critical habitat. Our most recent project involves the Archie Creek Fire Salvage Proposal from the Bureau of Land Management. Last summer, as many of you know, more than 40,000 acres were burned and there were more than 100 homes lost just in Douglas County alone. We are currently reviewing the agency's proposed actions to salvage log more than 6,000 acres and remove more than 2,000 acres of designated hazard trees. Moving forward, we have some wins. We are now ground truthing. I am very excited about this. This means that we properly read agency scoping letters and we physically inspect the proposed timber sales and we write our comments accordingly. Ground truthing will also greatly assist us in holding the agencies accountable for actions that they take on our public lands. We are also in the process of developing a climate page on our website and a climate radio show. This is all with the great help of Casey Hovick and I greatly appreciate your effort. So please stay tuned and join us for that as well. In closing, I want to give a huge shout out to the Conservation Committee team, Janice Reed, Diana Pace and Cindy Haas. Your knowledge and experience are invaluable and very much appreciated by me. I couldn't do this without you. We are always looking for volunteers and input from folks, folks in the community who are interested in getting involved in conservation. Our committee meets the first Tuesday of the month on, at uh, 5 p.m. Pacific time. You are welcome and encouraged to join us. Thanks for tuning in and cheers. Hi, I'm Tony Cannon. I'm the Wilderness Committee Chair and also an Umpqua Watersheds Board member. I'd like to thank everybody for watching and participating in this event and events in the future. Um, before we get going, I'd just like to say a big thank you to all of the folks that are with me on the Wilderness Committee. Um, they are so dedicated and it is a wonderful group of people and I'm proud to be with them and to, to do this important work with them. All right, so the um, little bit about the, what the Wilderness Committee has been doing lately. Um, as everybody knows, the challenges of 2020 um, have been great, and uh, the pandemic has made it hard on all of us, and it is really difficult to get some of the stuff done that we need to get done. And so um, as we kind of work through the pandemic and as things slowly improve, um, we're also changing our strategies a little bit and um, kind of coming out sunny right now. So. Um, at the same time, there is a changing political climate and some of those conversations is a little more complicated than it appears at first. And so we are kind of threading that needle and trying to hit all the right notes to get the things done that we need to get done. 
Um, our big ticket thing that we're working on is a Crater Lake Wilderness proposal. We are um, doing a number of things to work with that. Um, it's been a long process and there's probably still a lot of work left to go, but we're keeping at it um, with continued work and advocacy. Uh, one thing that has changed, we did work with Oregon Wild um, to add two sections in the uh, Umpqua, North Umpqua River drainage in that watershed to, um, to the proposal, the uh, Spring River section and the Steelhead, Steelhead Creek section. Um, big benefit of the Spring River is a incredibly high volume of fresh water. Um, and it is also an exceptionally beautiful area. One of the most beautiful areas I've seen in the Umpqua. Um, Steelhead Creek is full of healthy forests. It is prime fish habitat and it is also has, uh, sorry, it also contains vital and unique bat habitat. So we're, we are very pleased with the work that we've done to, um, to get those added to the proposal. Um, we have been working on a series of outreach videos and um, to go out to the public. They have a number of, of kind of uses and points. Um, <clears throat> we're looking at them as potentially being, you know, scientific and educational. Some are about public advocacy and some are just gonna be poetic and powerful. Um, and we have one of those completed. And so what I will do is show this to you now. We tend to see water in a mountain stream as separate from the water in the river flowing through town. As separate from the water flowing through the taps in our homes. homes. As separate from the water flowing through our bodies. Every, Every step, step of, of the, the way, way, this water, water is, is part, part of us. us. This water is our ancestors yesterday. yesterday. It is our families today. today. It is our descendants tomorrow. Water is not a political issue. issue. It is an issue of life and legacy. legacy. Defined by prioritizing the health of the functioning ecosystems we rely yeah. on. Its health is our health. health. Its future is our future. As, As the, the water, water goes, goes so, so we go. go. Every opportunity to improve water quality is an opportunity to improve our lives. lives. The most effective method for this is through wilderness. wilderness. The stronger we support the health of our springs, creeks, streams, and rivers, rivers. the stronger we support the legacy of our ancestors, ancestors, of our families today, and for those who will follow in our footsteps. Water, water is, is the, the stream that, that connects, connects us to, to the, the future. future. That video was put together by members of Umpqua Watersheds and also uh, members of the community at large. So it did have a lot of inclusive elements. And I think those types of videos are going to, going to uh, be pretty, pretty uh, impactful moving forward. Um, other, <clears throat> other things we've been working on are actual presentations. Um, we've had one, uh, involving uh, exploring the wilderness using LIDAR imaging. We had about 20 something people um, involved in that. And that was a pretty fun one for us. Um, the purpose of these education, public education opportunities isn't just to inform the public about available resources, but it is also, it also promotes uh, the wilderness committee and Umpqua watersheds as a source of education and service, which is a good perspective for folks to have of us. Um, we are going to continue our uh, work as political advocates. Um, we have fa helped facilitated the sending of um, over a thousand postcards, I believe, from citizens to um, senators and uh, representatives to uh, advocate for the Cray Lake Wilderness proposal and wilderness in general. Um, that's been really successful. Unfortunately, that's also gone by the wayside since you have to be around people to make that happen. And with the, the pandemic, we haven't been able to do that. But as it lifts and things slowly are improving, we will um, pick that right back up. Uh, we've also work, been working on merchandising 
as a way to um, get out and get people's attention. Um, we're working on some hats and stickers, either bumper stickers or water bottle stickers. Those are really popular these days. Um, and so we're working on that stuff. Moving forward, um, we have some big plans to continue to grow through our advocacy, our work, and our outreach um, with the amazing, fantastic people on the Wilderness Committee. Um, every meeting we have, I think we move closer and closer towards getting some great things done. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everybody for listening and thank you for your support. Hello, my name is Ryan Kincaid and I am a United Communities AmeriCorps member serving in the role of environmental education and outreach leader for UMC Watersheds. I'll be sharing the education portion of tonight's event. This is actually my second term of AmeriCorps. Last year, I served as a Habitat Steward with Eco-AmeriCorps in Vermont. Prior to that, I taught middle school science for five years in the Finger Lakes region of New York State, where I grew up. You might be thinking, wow, she traveled a long way to get here. <laughs> and you'd certainly be right. Ever since I first learned about Uncle Watersheds, I knew that I wanted to get involved with this organization, and I've thoroughly enjoyed becoming part of the Uncle Watersheds family. Having a background in teaching provided me with the skills and creativity needed to help the education program to thrive even amidst the pandemic. Last fall, I continued the Home Explorer program started by the previous AmeriCorps member, Robin, until schools transitioned back to an in-person or hybrid model. We adapted the Home Explorer program to include a material lending component, and UMCO Watersheds now has microscopes, snap circuits kits, and water quality monitoring test kits, which are pictured here, available for local homeschooling and non-homeschooling families to borrow. I also helped to develop a number of new programs and activities to engage people of all ages near and far. One of these programs is the Turning Over a New Leaf Book Club for Teens and Adults. Braiding Sweetgrass, Unbowed, and Last Child in the Woods are a few of the books that we've read. The group meets once a month to discuss a book or topic related to the environment. For youths ages 9 to 12, I led a club called Changemakers. In this club, participants could select a program to focus on, research and learn more about the problem, then brainstorm actions they could take to solve the problem. We just had our final session on May 2nd. Another exciting educational offering that's taken place during my service term is the increase in radio show programming. I host a show called Living Downstream, which explores various environmental topics of interest in Southern Oregon on larger Pacific Northwest region. Each episode features interviews with one or more scientists or other experts, as well as information about upcoming activities and events. So far, we've had episodes which have focused on water quality, sustainable gardening, bees, habitat restoration, hiking, forest bathing, the role of art environmentalism, wildlife rehabilitation, and more. If you are knowledgeable about an environmentally related topic, or if you enjoy writing music or poetry that has to do with nature, this would be a great opportunity for you to get involved. As we expand our programming, we're also hoping to develop ways for youths to have their voices and ideas heard on the radio. Check out my show, Living Downstream, Saturdays at 9 a.m. or Sundays at 6 p.m., or keep an eye on the Living Downstream page of the KQUA website to learn more. One of the most rewarding activities that I've been involved with so far during my term with AmeriCorps and UMCO Watersheds has been a teacher training offered to Douglas County educators in March. This training called Learning in the UMCO Watershed, Engaging K-12 Students Through Nature Connections and STEAM Activities covered a variety of topics, including local environmental challenges, how and why to teach about climate change, creative problem solving and nature journaling, as well as local opportunities for teachers and their students. The teachers were given a chance to network and to plan how to incorporate some of the concepts presented throughout the day. I think one of the reasons why I found this event so rewarding was that I got to see it come full circle. I applied for a grant through the Cliff Bar Family Foundation last fall and coordinated much of the programming for the day. Serving as an AmeriCorps member with UMCA Watersheds has connected me with multitude of people and organizations whom I might not otherwise have come into contact with. 
and the teacher training engaged so many presenters and volunteers all coming together to support teachers. Having been an educator myself, I know just how valuable and how undervalued teachers often are. Through the financial support of the Cliff Bar Family Foundation grant, we were able to provide a number of free resources, including curriculum and activity guides, as well as $100 stipends upon the completion of the program for each of the teachers. To build on this training, we'll be developing a Resources for Educators page on the Uncle Watershed's website. Just this past month, in celebration of Earth Day, Uncle Watersheds hosted a weekend of service, which included various activities, including a river cleanup. A lot of planning went into making sure that this was a COVID conscious event. We encouraged people to sign up in family groups and each group was assigned a particular location along the river. To add some extra fun to this event, we raffled off several low waste and zero waste items, including bamboo utensils or to go wear, a reusable bag, as well as a cotton mesh produce bag. An additional component of this year's event was that each group was provided with a water quality monitoring test kit to collect data at their site. We're excited to compile the data and hope to establish a river monitoring program, which will engage youths and families as citizen scientists in their local watershed. Also during our weekend of service, we held an Eco Innovations Challenge. This was an opportunity for Douglas County residents to brainstorm solutions to local environmental challenges. April 25th saw the presentation portion of this challenge. We heard from two kids, nine and 11 years old, as well as two adults about various problems and solutions, such as the need for nature-based after-school programs for youths, the increased problem of litter in the watershed, paired with an idea to turn it into art, harm posed by roadside spraying of pesticides and herbicides, as well as a proposal for surveying native bees to assess the impacts of climate change. Uncle Watersheds is excited to support these projects in various ways, and we're eager to partner with other community members to put these plans into action to help our local environment. But that is not all. <laughs> in addition to implementing the programs and activities proposed by community members during the Eco Innovations Challenge, we'll be offering a number of additional programs and events in which you can get involved over the next several months. On June 5th, we'll be holding a virtual volunteer training, which will cover a variety of new ways to join the Ump Watersheds community and get involved with the much needed environmental conservation and restoration work that we're doing in Southern Oregon and beyond. As people are getting vaccinated and we're getting more accustomed to doing activities in a way that minimizes people's exposure to the COVID-19 virus, we're preparing once again to, hope to host our Twin Lakes Wilderness Campout. This year, it will take place July 23rd to 25th. Spots will be limited, so please reach out soon if you'd like to register your child for this memorable experience. Additionally, we're collecting photos as part of our scenes of the Umpqua photo compilation, and we'll be holding a contest for photos to be included in a 2022 calendar. Whew, that was a lot. If you'd like to learn about how you can get involved with the various educational programs I've described, or if you have ideas for other possible activities that we could do, please reach out via email at ryan at umpquawatersheds.org. We protect what we know and love, and education is a way to engage people of all ages to help them learn about and appreciate their local environment. I hope you'll join with us to do this important, fun, and much needed work. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ken Carloni and I'm the chair of Umqua Watersheds Restoration Committee. And I'd like to tell you about some of the projects we've been working on for the last year. We've been working very hard this year at Umqua Watersheds on a number of really exciting initiatives. And we've been working with quite a range of partners on these projects. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more about them. Over the last year, we've been working with Water Watch of Oregon, the Steamboaters, the Native Fish Society and Oregon Wild to try to solve the problem of the Winchester Dam. This dam was built in the late 1800s and has some real problems. Uh, over the years, uh, work was done on it with no permits. Past repairs have killed salmon and lamprey. 
the decaying fish ladder is ineffective and it's very difficult for fish to find the entrance of the ladder. And unfortunately, they're attracted to these what we call false attractions, area where the water actually comes under the dam. And they're trying to move upstream there, getting into areas where there is rebar and other sharp materials and it's killing the fish. And not the least of which of our concerns is the danger to the downstream community from this old wood crib dam that could fail catastrophically at any time, endangering the lives of folks in the communities downstream. So we're asking the owners of the dam to either repair the dam or Water Watch and others will raise the money to to take the dam out entirely and restore the river to its original state. The Rock Creek Hatchery was built in 1925 by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to try to solve the problem of declining fish populations in a particularly 20th century way, that is just raise up a bunch of fish in tanks as opposed to solving the problems which caused the loss of those runs in the first place. The hatchery fish, as many of you know, compete with wild stock. It's not a particularly efficient process. It's very expensive. Uh, and we're suggesting, along with the steamboaters and the Native Fish Society, Pacific Rivers, the Conservation Angler and Trout Unlimited, that the facility not be rebuilt it's gonna take a lot of money to rebuild and we believe that there are higher priorities for that money in fixing habitat rather than just producing more hatchery fish. We would like to see the total elimination of the summer steelhead hatchery program and return the North Umpqua to an all wild Salmonid River. The South Umpqua Spring Chinook Run is in serious trouble. Over the last several decades, uh, there has been a steep decline in this run, uh, average of less than 200 fish per year and literally 28 returned to their spawning grounds in 2018. It was originally lumped in with all of the Spring Chinook from the West Coast until researchers at the University of California at Davis discovered that it is an evolutionarily significant unit. That is, it is genetically distinct from all other runs. So the Steamboaters, Native Fish Society, Pacific Rivers, Conservation Angler, and the Center for Biological Diversity and the Wild Salmon Center have teamed up to come up with a petition to list the South Umpqua Spring Chinook Run under the Endangered Species Act. We believe that this is the Springer's last best hope to avoid complete extinction. As any of you who have recently driven up the North Umpqua River know, the Archie Creek fire that burned last fall was a devastating fire and damaged um, a wide swath of, of habitat. It was a climate driven fire, largely through plantations, both public and private, leaving behind uh, habitat that is highly degraded. We have teamed up with the National Forest Foundation, Phoenix School, Umpqua National Forest, Umpqua uh, Community College, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to put together a grant, which is, which is still pending, but we have high hopes of getting to collect uh, seeds and starts of native plants to take up to the Dorena nursery at the federal nursery at Dorena to grow these plants out to provide seeds and propagates to be able to return to these damaged sites. We've chosen some high impact recreation areas and we will be employing Phoenix Youth Crews and UCC students along with Umpqua Watersheds volunteers to collect those plants and then eventually replant them in areas that need to be restored 
uh, in the area of the Archie Creek fire. Lastly, I'd like to run through a few partnerships that are not formal uh, partnerships with Umqua Watersheds, but our board members sit on these uh, committees and are very much involved with them. The Umqua Oak Partnership, a partnership of public and private uh, agencies, private landowners, nonprofits, to try to identify and restore oak uh, savanna and woodlands on the Umpqua. The Umpqua Native Plant Partnership, a brand new partnership to try to develop seed sources for plants that are specific uh, pollinator resources for the pollinators that live here on the Umpqua. Uh, the Partnership for Umpqua Rivers, a uh, long time uh, partnership on the Umpqua. Casey Hovick, our executive director, is the president elect and will soon take over the presidency there. And the U Creek Land Alliance, we continue to restore oak habitat and produce biochar there under NRCS and US Fish and Wildlife Service grants. Thanks for watching and listening. And if you'd like more information on restoration and want to get involved, uh, we meet jointly with the Conservation Committee on the first Tuesday of each month at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And you can contact me or anybody else at Umqua Watersheds if you'd like more information. So thanks. Hi, folks. I'm Casey Hovick, Executive Director with Umqua Watersheds. I'm also the outreach chair and proud mentor and supervisor for AmeriCorps program. 2020 has been, was a very challenging year for us. Over the last 14 months, we've all had to deal with isolation and trying to find new ways to do things. But I couldn't be prouder of how resilient Umpqua Watersheds has been, uh, thanks for the tireless efforts on, on the staff and volunteers at Umpqua Watershed. So I'm very proud to share this uh, slideshow with you and want to thank you for making these things possible through your support, encouragement, and, and for those of you who volunteered. So we, as I mentioned, we had to be very resilient. We had uh, for the second year in a row, one of our major fundraisers, the banquet and the silent auction had to be canceled. Uh, summer camps, outdoor camps, uh, summer concerts and outdoor camps were canceled, normal hikes, Camp AmeriCorps, River Appreciation Day, and of course the 11th annual Umpqua Brewfest could be held last year. A lot of organizations would say, what do we do now? But we didn't uh, waste any time and okay, we're gonna find new and better ways to do things and to use our time. And so coming out of the pandemic, I feel in many ways, we're much stronger thanks to all the hard work everyone's done. So in the 2020, we logged over 3000 volunteer uh, hours of volunteer time with Umpqua Watersheds. Most of it with our board of directors and the people you see presenting tonight, as well as uh, Mark Eason and our bookkeeper, Diana. They've just done an outstanding job, put in so many hours, and it's really paid off. We did a strategic planning workshop in October that is guiding, guiding us for the next five years. We do monthly uh, committee and board meetings via Zoom like we're doing tonight. And we've learned how to collaborate in the process and accomplish so much. Most of us on the board uh, Zoom five, six hours a week, but it's, it's well worth it because of what we're accomplishing. We attended the Oregon Nonprofit Leaders Conference, which was held virtually. Uh, so Melanie McKinnon, our wonderful office manager, Janice Reed, our vice president, and, and our AmeriCorps, Ryan Kincaid and myself attended a day-long uh, virtual conference and learned so much. We had an opportunity at lunchtime to spend an hour with foundations and, and grantors and found out some really good uh, information to help us in grant writing. And we did a lot with facility management. Mark Eason is our treasurer and our facility management uh, uh, captain. And, and we have a wonderful committee that spends a lot of time on a monthly basis 
finding out how we can take care of our building, take care of our tenants and plan for the future. We have a wonderful uh, radio station. Hopefully you've tuned in, KQUA Radio. I'll be talking more about that in a minute. We have a quarterly newsletter that Janice Reed edits and our, our board of directors and a few volunteers add uh, content to that newsletter. We had a very successful AmeriCorps campaign. The website continues to be updated. Uh, Janice is our webmaster and again, does a wonderful job. And we had a few uh, hikes that were uh, COVID safe where we limited it to five to 10 people in separate cars. We have uh, participated uh, with several organizations and various projects uh, in the past year in planning for the future. And uh, I'm very excited about the things that we're doing together to protect our wonderful Umpqua water watersheds and to protect our community and, and bring people together uh, in, in ways uh, to uh, make a positive difference for our community. Patrick Snyder is our KQUA program director and spends many hours a week making sure that we have great music and great programs. And this year we probably accomplished more than ever uh, on our radio station. We're now live streaming uh, so that anyone can listen to the radio station anywhere in the world. We've got, uh, uh, it's, it's, you're able to access it via the Live 365 app. Uh, we're working on uh, a KQUA app that you'll be able to have on your phone and listen to the radio show anywhere, anytime you have access. We also uh, did a major upgrade to the website. I couldn't be prouder of the, uh, the original programming that Uncle Watersheds uh, does. Stan Petrosky got us started with radioactive restoration. I think he's done over 80 shows, possibly more, over the last two years and does just a fine job every week. We've uh, got Francis Etherington that does Conservation Today. And this year, I'm very proud of Ryan Kincaid for starting Living Downstream, a weekly uh, interview show that she's just a, done a wonderful job. I hope you'll tune in. And recently, uh, Janice Reed has started uh, Earth in Tune. It's a radio show with just songs about the environment. And right now, the, the chapters that she's doing is just focused on the river. So I think she's got seven shows that she's done and they're all songs which mention river in the title or in the song. It's a great show. I hope you'll tune in. We're working on uh, new things in the, in the future. The radio is a big part of our strategic vision to bring new people and new ideas into the organization and expand Umpqua Watershed's outreach outside of Roseburg to, to all of Oregon and beyond. We hope this summer that we'll be able to have COVID safe activities. Very promising that we'll be able to get back to some type of KQUA Outback stage concerts. We'll have hikes again. Camp AmeriCorps and River Appreciation uh, are on for the third uh, Saturday or third weekend of July. Uh, we'll be tabling at events. We're gonna have our Twin Lakes Youth Wilderness Camp out at the end of July. Uh, maybe an environmental film festival that we're working on in, uh, in the fall and a downsized Umpqua, uh, Umpqua Brew Fest. Our, one of our things that we're working on in outreach are our strategic goals. And one of the major parts of it is a, a capital campaign focusing on getting grants and fundraising to do renovations to our building and improving accessibility to our program, uh, our building. Uh, we're in the process of repurposing space formally leased out to uh, a local company uh, to build a community multimedia and technology room. We're going to build a K KQUA radio st studio, upgrade the KQA radio room, make space available for other nonprofits and community organizations to use as well as UW and our own members. 
Our goal is to increase capacity and resiliency by adding diversity and being more inclusive. It's very important our, our, by getting more people and different ideas and uh, different abilities and different backgrounds in the organization, we will become even more resilient and build capacity not only for ourselves, but other organizations and our community. Thank you so much for your support over the last uh, year. It's been a challenging year, but I'm very happy that uh, we're coming out stronger than we went in. And I look very much forward to seeing you all at our events this summer. Thank you so much for supporting Upper Watersheds. Please continue your financial support and volunteering when you can. Take care. Hi, I'm Ken Carloni. I'm the current president of Umpqua Watersheds. And along with that title comes the distinct privilege of being the one who gives out the Umpqua Watersheds annual awards. This year, uh, 2021, we have awards for volunteers of the year, lifetime volunteer, conservationists of the year, and lifetime conservationist. This year, we've chosen two volunteers of the year, and uh, they come as a match set, and that would be Connie Page and Rick Kriofsky. We are so grateful to all of the work they've put in over the last year for Umpqua Watersheds on the Wilderness Committee and our uh, various events, um, such, as, <laughs> such as we've been able to have them this year. Um, but Rick and Connie have just been stalwarts for us at Umpqua Watersheds. They've always been there when we've needed them. And so we uh, couldn't be more pleased to award this year's Volunteers of the Year to Connie Page and Rick Kriofsky. So congratulations and our heartfelt thanks. Our Conservationist of the Year for 2021 is Susan Applegate. And of course, we could have awarded her any number of these awards as lifetime volunteer, which I believe she's already gotten once, uh, um, or con lifetime conservationist, or any of those things. She has been a uh, supporter of Umpqua Watersheds and a solid member uh, for the last couple of decades. And uh, this year, we're, we're citing her as conservationist of the year because of her work uh, restoring a pond on the old Applegate property. Uh, she's been working very hard with, uh, uh, you know, her own hands and then uh, the help of experts to try to repopulate the pond with native species and uh, balance the pond in a way that it will be self-sustaining for years to come. So Susan Applegate, uh, the Umpqua salutes you. This year's Lifetime Volunteer Award goes to Stuart Leibowitz, who um, is the guy that you've seen around town uh, with a clipboard or organizing, you know, collecting signatures, making sure that things happen. Um, has been the spark plug for the Douglas County Global Warming Coalition, has been a sustaining supporter of Umpqua Watersheds for a number of years. And uh, I believe that he's even gotten this, this very award before, but if anybody deserves more than one lifetime volunteer award, it's Stuart Leibowitz. Stuart is a dynamo. He is a driven man. Uh, when it comes to the environment and the climate. And Umpqua Watersheds is proud to name him a lifetime volunteer in our 2021 awards. So Stuart, congratulations and thank you. It's difficult to say enough about this year's Lifetime Conservationist Awardee, Stan Petrowski, Back in 2009, I believe, Umpqua Watersheds awarded him the Conservationist of the Year Award for his work in uh, suction dredge mining reform and 
beaver reintroduction work. And shortly after that, he joined the Umpqua Watersheds Board and spent five years uh, as our president until just a couple of years ago. And then very recently has retired from the board to spend more time at his ranch out in Drew with his lovely wife, Sandy, who you can see in the picture here with him. Stan remains active as the president of the South Umpqua Rural Community Partnership. Um, and he sits on the steering committee of the Umpqua Oak Partnership and is still involved in uh, uh, South Umpqua Spring Chinook um, work and on and on and on. Uh, uh, Stan has been a driving force for conservation and restoration on the Umpqua. Uh, he does a weekly radio program on the KQUA radio station uh, where he interviews uh, people or uh, write or, or does you know long uh, long form radio essays uh, to bring to life important issues, um, ecological conservation restoration issues here on the Umpqua. Um, he's won numerous awards uh, over the years and has been a cherished member um, of Umpqua Watersheds for many years. And we expect to continue to work with Stan um, informally. And uh, we will certainly see him uh, on Zoom meetings and eventually uh, back in person again. And so until, uh, uh, until we can uh, be together again and actually uh, give you a hug, Stan, um, congratulations. And um, I salute you, my brother. Well, hey, as you can see, Umpqua Watersheds has been really busy and productive. The next part of our program is our guest speaker, Jeff McEnroe. Jeff's going to talk about the Archer, Archie Creek Fire Restoration Project from a fisheries biologist's perspective. You know, from a very young age, Jeff was obsessed with throwing logs larger than himself into the creeks and rivers where his dad was trying to fish, which earned him the nickname Woody. Jeff received his bachelor's degree in fishery science from Oregon State University and a glutton for punishment, he decided to go after a master's degree while studying juvenile salmonid passage through culverts. After several fun temporary jobs, Jeff ended up at the Roseburg Bureau of Land Management where he gets to be a kid again and put logs larger than himself back into the streams. When he isn't working, Jeff is an avid fly fisherman, rafter, photographer, husband, and father. So take it away, Jeff. It's, it's an honor to be here, and uh, I'm going to talk tonight about the Rock Creek Restoration and the Arch Archie Creek Fire. Uh, I think a lot of you know about the Archie Creek Fire, so I'll probably keep that pretty, pretty brief. But we're basically going to cover the fire impacts, uh, why Rock Creek is a priority, kind of the need for post-fire restoration, and then kind of what we have planned up there. And then just to note, this this presentation really just covers the work on the BLM lands. Uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is, is working on some of the private lands, and the Forest Service has kind of their own plan. So uh, the first thing I like to talk about is the notable species in Rock Creek, because, you know, you get asked, why, why Rock Creek a lot? and it's because we have a very diverse assemblage of fish species up there. Uh, spring Chinook salmon, uh, one of the only tributaries off the North Oak Paw where the Spring Chinook spawn outside of the main river. Uh, we have Oregon Coast Coho salmon, summer and winter steelhead, uh, three different uh, life histories of the coastal cutthroat trout, Pacific lamprey, we have uh, the western pearl shell mussel and the foot Hill yellow legged frog, which are both bureau sensitive species. And I think my favorite critter, we have a lot of beaver activity up there. So, you know, there's a potential for a lot of watershed benefits up there um, that nature can provide to beavers. And so, Rock Creek really has arguably some of the best potential salmonid habitat in the North Umpqua because it has these large, intact floodplains, which I'll go into later. 
So the Archie Creek fire started September eighth, twenty twenty. Uh, it's a day I'll remember forever. I was out in, you know, out in the field and saw the column come up, and I watched it burn that whole day into the evening. Uh, some of the most extreme fire behavior I've ever seen in twenty years of fighting fires. Uh, it ended up burning one hundred thirty-one thousand acres. And what I really liked it set home with folks is that this was a once in a century's disturbance event uh, based on uh, the amount of old growth for forests that burned with 100% mortality. And so to state it in a different way, um, this area hasn't burned with this intensity for at least two or 300 years. Um, and that kind of sets sets the stage for, you know, some of the restoration work and some of the unknown impacts that we're going to talk about. This is just uh, some quick photos from the watershed. This is uh, East Fork Rock Creek, 100% uh, riparian mortality in here. Um, basically, everything is in there. And then this is a photo of Lower Rock Creek. I like to show this one because you can see the old growth stand in the background of the photo there. And uh, even though it looks like there's needles on those trees, those are all brown. And, and all of those trees uh, died in the fire. So, the after, aftermath of the fire, I'm sure everybody's aware, you know, lost 109 structures, including the Rock Creek Hatchery. We basically had a 98 to 100 percent tree mortality in a 100 square mile area, and a, like 70 percent of the Rock Creek watershed was burned, 40,000 acres in like high severity. So that resulted in basically a complete loss of stream shade uh, for the streams within that fire area. Now, what are some of the predicted impacts? That's a little harder to do just because uh, we're talking about something that, you know, hasn't happened for 200 or 300 years. And so trying to understand the impacts of that, um, it, you know, there's a lot of questions out there. But we do have a burn area emergency response team that came in. They do some hydraulic analysis and they predicted anywhere from 300 to an 800 percent increase in peak flows in streams in the fire area. And, you know, there's some things that I think are common sense that we're going to know happen. We just aren't, we don't know what, to what extent they're going to happen. And so we have, you know, as the tree roots deteriorate, we're going to have landslides and mass wasting. Um, we're going to have fire killed trees that are falling into the streams. Our stream temperatures are going to increase. We're going to get increases in primary production because we have increased sunlight hitting the streams. And you can be sure that we're going to have a lot of noxious weeds that take advantage of all this disturbed area. So, you know, most studies point to fish populations decreasing for, you know, about three to five years because of all these impacts uh, post-fire. But then the positive note is those fish populations tend to rebound and actually do better, you know, in that kind of intermediate disturbance time. So uh, we have something to look forward to. So why do we need to even do restoration in the first place? I'm sure a lot of folks here know the reasons why, but I like to just go through them real quick uh, to make sure kind of everybody's on the same page. Really, the reason is, you know, we had basically industrialized logging from the 1940s to the 1980s with, you know, almost no protections on streams. You know, this, this heavily impacted Rock Creek. That picture in the top right is a... BLM bulldozer uh, pushing wood out of the creek. You know, they thought that wood in the creek was a bad thing for a long time, and it blocked salmon uh, from spawning. And anyway, they spent a lot of time taking log jams out of creeks. And then there was even a mill, that picture in the lower right there, the Douglas County Mill from the 1940s to the 1950s in the watershed. So, you know, even more impacts from that. And then you add on to that, you know, channel manipulation, riparian harvest, riparian road building. And then after, you know, in the middle of all that, we get the 1964 flood. And so that's resulted in uh, very degraded or simplified stream conditions in Rock Creek. And so uh, we, we estimate that the stream down cut about six to eight feet. There's almost no large wood or log jams left. So when it down cut, it disconnected from those big extensive floodplains and side channels that it developed. And it really just resulted in unnaturally high stream energy. So we can't get logs to catch anymore in the basin because that energy is so high. And so any trees or substrate that fall, you know, moves into 
uh, Rock Creek gets you know flushed right down to the north of the doesn't get caught in Rock Creek. So we can look at Archie Creek Fire as a tragic loss, which which it was, uh, or as I've kind of come to uh, eventually, is an opportunity to right those wrongs in the past. We know there's going to be a lot of substrate coming in, a lot of wood coming in, and we need to capture that and start rebuilding this watershed and this stream. Some of the basic goals of the restoration work that we're planning is to replace those missing pieces. We've got to get those large, stable log jams back into the system. We need to decrease that stream energy, allowing gravel to abrade and create spawning beds. We need to capture that post-fire substrate and wood moving through the system like I just talked about. And then we need to reconnect those extensive floodplains and side channels. We're looking at a multi phased approach. Uh, we prioritize reaches, and kind of the situation on the ground dictates you know, what and how much we can accomplish. So we're focusing on kind of the most bang for the buck on the phase. So we're looking right now at, at a three phased approach. Um, phase one is we're going to try to put as many trees into Rock Creek as possible. Uh, to build these large stable log dams, we, we need to utilize these fire killed trees now because they, if we don't utilize them now, they'll be lost to uh, hazard tree work um, either through uh, right away agreements or through the own BLM process of ha you know hazard tree roads and recreation sites. And so we want to utilize these trees now while we have them. And then also the trees start deteriorating. And so if we wait three years to put these trees in, when we fall them or push them over, they're going to break into much smaller pieces and not be as useful for creating these large jams. And then we also need to capture this wood that's going to be moving through the system next winter. And so we really want to get some, some stuff in there to capture that. Phase two, we're looking at enhancing and reconnecting the floodplains, providing that off-channel habitat and cold water refugia as the stream temperatures come up. And then phase three, you know, we don't, we just know we're going to have to do some adaptive management in phases one and two because we're in such a dynamic area with, you know, unpredictable impacts coming. And then we're really going to focus on the riparian and tributary restoration in, in that third phase. So phase one is, as I talked about, we got to replace those fundamental uh, log jams that were in Rock Creek historically that allowed wood to accumulate and, you know, substrates to upgrade. We're going to be doing that this summer, July 1st to September 15th. That's the in-water work window. Uh, our goal is to build 16 large dams on the BLM lands that will capture that wood and substrate in safe areas, scour some deep and complex pools, and begin that channel aggregation so we can reconnect the floodplain. So what do these large stable jams look like? I, I get a lot of questions on that from folks. And basically it's what's called the natural channel design concept. And it comes from studies on the Queets River in Washington, where you know the Queets River is as close as we can get to kind of a reference system. So it's undammed, has still has big old growth stands next to it, and you can see how wood would naturally accumulate in you know, an unmanipulated river or stream. And so what comes out of those studies on that system is log jams in larger streams accumulate in two points. They accumulate on the apex of a bar, um, as you can see right here, they call the apex bar jam. Or, as I'll show you in the next slide, they, they can gather on a meander jam and a meander bed. And so a lot of this design work was designed by Brian Baer with the U.S. Forest Service Enterprise team. He's got 30 plus years of experience restoring large river systems. And we quickly saw Rock Creek was kind of, well, outside of my expertise. You know, I'm used to restoring smaller streams. And so we brought Brian in to do a lot of the design work and help us work through a lot of these, you know, big stream issues. This is uh, just a picture of the meander jam. You can see that it gets caught on this meander bend here. These are some of the designs that help mimic it. And these natural channel design jams, they're, they're an engineered log jam. So they, uh, Brian comes in and calculates 100-year flood elevations, max scour depths, stream grade and substrate size, buoyancy calculations, all that stuff. 
and then he develops a design that's able to withstand a 100-year flood event. And so the way they do that is they actually dig down into the substrate um, to the max scour depth, and they build the log jam up out of the substrate. And so when you're looking at this net, you know, the pictures of the log jams, you know, that's only like half the log jam. The other half is kind of down in the substrate, and everything's kind of locked together. And these log jams are actually designed to capture more wood and increase in size. So it's just kind of like the core of the log jam that's there, and then they're designed to capture, you know, wood moving through the system. Here's an example of a design Brian drew up for us. Uh, we're looking at trying to do some full spanning log jams uh, in Rock Creek, which is a very big system, but we have some large old growth trees to work with that were fire killed, and so we're, we're able to do these channel spanning jams when sometimes you may not be able to. Here's a picture of a apex bar jam on the Salmon River that Brian designed and built. Uh, this this jam and, and the jams on the Salmon River uh, withstood a you know a hundred year flood event and just gained size and, and created better habitat and so they've been tested you know it, there's a lot of uh, monitoring on these showing a huge increase in fish numbers and reds of uh, you know upstream of them as the gravel accumulates so there's a lot of monitoring and you know previous work that shows that these are very effective structures. Kind of in summary, we're looking at, you know, the map on the right here is the reaches in Rock Creek that we've designed. The numbered jams are the, you know, those really big log jams. And then there's some statistics over there on the left that show you how many sites we're going to do and the number of trees. And so we're looking at roughly 16 large dam sites and 830 plus. Uh, this is a big contract. It's going to be a three hundred and twenty thousand dollar contract. We're going to have two excavators, a shovel, an off-road dump truck. We're going to have a lot of equipment in there because we have a pretty narrow window to accomplish this much work. And we're going to, you know, it's about two months of equipment time. So I'm going to be really busy this summer. Here's just a couple maps. Uh, one is the Annabelle Reach. The other is kind of the Lower Rock Creek Campground Reach. Kind of just shows you. The blue is a 25-year floodplain, that kind of blue shading. You know, the numbered uh, kind of polygons there are these large log jams. You can see they span basically the width of the valley floor. It's not just a log jam of a creek. You have logs spread throughout the floodplain as well. So just to recap, uh, our goals in phase one are to build 16 large, stable, full spanning log jams, capture that post-fire stream wood that's going to be coming down, capture that post-fire substrate, uh, specifically spawning gravels, and to scour some deep. So a little less information about phase two and phase three, just because it's so far out, and we're trying to focus on phase one, but we know what we want to do, and we have some basic designs to get there. So phase two is going to be all about getting reconnection with that extensive floodplain in Rock Creek, reconnecting side channels, and then doing some tributary restoration as well. One of the main ways we're going to do reconnect with those floodplains is uh, Brian builds what's called constructive riffles. So he put, brings in a mix of stream rounded boulders, uh, cobble, gravel, and some sand, and mixes that together in the right ratio. And he creates what's called a constructive riffle. He raises that stream bed three to four feet. He gets the grade just right so that um, spawning gravels drop out upstream of that constructed riffle, and so we'll get some huge spawning bed areas. And they're very natural looking. I've gone to these in the field, and you can't tell where they are. Brian has to point you out to where these constructed riffles are. And they just provide that almost instant reconnection with the floodplain rather than waiting years for that substrate to grade and build up. So the other part of this um, floodplain enhancement is what we're calling groundwater channels and pools. And so in Rock Creek, you have a huge floodplain, and that whole floodplain is all made out of cobble, previously deposited cobble and gravel stream. So you have a big water bank just under the surface of the rocks. It's you know, hyperate flow, we call it. It's flow that's within the substrate, but not exposed to air, so it's underneath all that rock there. 
and these groundwater channels and pools kind of kickstart that floodplain development. We're going to move in, we're going to excavate out some pools and channels in areas where they were historically, you're finding those by LIDAR, and on the ground you can see them. And we excavate them down to four to six feet until we hit that groundwater. And then you have this flowing cooler water during the summer that's off-channel habitat. So when these high temperatures come that we know are going to come because of the loss of riparian canopy, the fish are going to have, you know, the juvenile fish, adult fish are going to have areas to duck into that are could be 10 degrees cooler. We also come in and we add some trees to the pools that we create for cover. Um, these have been implemented with a very high success rate on the salmon and zigzag rivers. And like I said before, they're going to provide that critical, what we call cold water refugia for salmonids during those high summer school temperatures. So the goals of that phase two are to construct over 13,000 feet of groundwater channels, 32 groundwater pools. We're going to reconnect the stream with uh, over 60 acres of a floodplain uh, with eight to 10 of these constructed ripples. And we have a pretty extensive monitoring program to, you know, Keep an eye on this for effectiveness. So phase three, even less information on phase three. Um, basically, the name of the game with phase three is adaptive management. We're going to be monitoring everything we've done in phase one and two, and adaptively, you know, if we need to add more wood, we're going to add more wood. We're going to have the trees to add. If we need to construct more channels, or we need to change the depth of those channels, we're going to maybe do that. And then we're really going to be focusing on riparian vegetation restoration. Uh, our botanists at the BLM really have a kind of wait and see approach because of you know this high severity fire. They, they want to wait a year or two and see what's coming back and then develop a riparian planting plan based on you know what species we're missing. Um, we're probably going to be doing a lot of noxious weed treatments during that time, things like that. That's all I have on the Rock Creek uh, restoration project. Uh, I'd be happy to entertain any questions from Casey. Uh, and I have my contact information there. Please, anybody who has questions on the project, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a phone call. I'm a pretty busy guy these days, but I, I will try to respond to any questions I get. Thank you so much, Jeff. This was an excellent presentation. We learned a lot. Uh, you will get several questions. I know uh, one person already mentioned because of the you know problems with invasives coming in, and and you talked about noxious weeds. How is that going to be dealt with, and how is the water going to be protected in, in the process? That's a good question, Casey. I don't know yet. We're trying to build the basis of a plan. So we're starting to go after some grants. You guys put together that grant with the Phoenix School to get some labor to attack this problem when it comes. We're working with Arena Seed Orchard to help help starting to grow some, you know, native plants that we're gonna need. So we're kind of trying to think ahead on that, but it's it's just gonna be something that we're gonna have to watch and kind of manage as it develops. And I think the best thing we can do right now is get all those parts in place so that we can move fast when we need to. Uh, I've been slightly optimistic up in the watershed. I'm seeing some of the alders that made it through the fire that are sprouting, which is great. A lot of the willows are coming back super strong, but I am seeing blackberry sprouts pop up too. And so it's going to be one of these things where we just have to try to manage it as we go and plan ahead and get the grant money in place so that we can we can move fast and cover big areas. Yeah, that there's so much to, to be learned about these types of fires, and I imagine the agencies are learning all the time. I, I'm just curious, how do you capture that, what you're learning? Who's responsible for, okay, these are assumptions. How do we capture that so that we are, are actually learning from the process? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, and I appreciate that question because I'm not doing this in a vacuum either. You know, there's other fish biologists at the BLM that are helping me through this. Um, we work with the Watershed Council, you know, partnership with the Amphal River. They're helping plan this and think about this project. We brought in Brian Bear, who's, you know, an expert in these restoration projects to kind of help guide us through it and do the designs, help us implement on the ground. And so it's really a team effort. 
And then within that team, we also have, you know, the Watershed Council Monitoring Group, Water Quality Monitoring Group. And so we've been working with them to develop a, a pretty, as extensive as we can, monitoring program to monitor, you know, water quality, fish numbers. We're going to be doing a huge number of photo points. So taking before and after photos of the project. It, it's almost a whole other presentation as to the monitoring we're going to do on this project. But I, you know, in my experience, the, the best thing you can do is implement the project to the best of your knowledge and then monitor that over time and adjust as you need to. And so that's the plan. We always, we always want to have a robust monitoring in place, effectiveness monitoring in place, uh, to kind of help you move forward through the project. Yeah, we've been uh, in contact with uh, Sandy Line and, and Joe Carnes uh, on the monitoring. We actually did some monitoring during our recent river cleanup at 10 sites. And so we're going to provide them with that data. And so we're in the process of trying to do some citizen science of, of getting people mobilized to help supplement what they're doing because they have a small crew. Uh, I think that's really important. That is really important. You are correct. Citizen science is the future because if patterns keep going, you know, the I'm down to, in about a month, I will be the only fish biologist at the Roseburg BLM for a while. And so funding has been decreasing, staffing has been decreasing, and we're trying to do a lot more with a lot less. And so integrating that citizen science and getting volunteers involved and coming up with good plans is really the future of monitoring because that is the hardest thing to find is is a workforce to do the monitoring. And and funding can be hard to find for monitoring as well. So getting that volunteer workforce to be the more important. I appreciate that. One last thing, the third Saturday of July is River Appreciation Day and we've got the Steamboat Ball Field Reserve, we're going to have a major event. We're going to invite all the agencies and PER and other organizations to come in there and, you know, talk about the Archie Creek. What we're trying to do is give people hope what we can do collaboratively to help support the great work that you all are doing and give people, empower people to be part of the solution. This forest, the, the, the Archie Creek area, will never be what it was in our lifetime. But if people can have an impact on doing something, it'll help, especially after uh, 14 months of isolation, people coming together and, and talking about you know, positive possibilities and collaboration uh, and not all the negativity that we, we've seen at times in the last uh, few months, trying to give people some hope there. That's great, Casey. I will try to be there. I am all for that. You know, I was driving through the Rock Creek watershed the day after the fire. And I'm not going to lie, I was depressed for about, you know, eight to 10 days. And then I finally just kind of thought, well, I can keep being depressed or I can start, you know, looking to the future and try to get this thing right for, you know, our kids or our kids' kids. And so I fully support that. And I also think it's a great thing to get people together and collaborate because there's so many moving parts with a lot of this post-fire restoration work that we need to be talking with each other and not kind of, you know, stepping over each other or reinventing things or things like that. And so the more collaboration, the better, and the more support from the public we can get, the better. So I, I fully support it. And we're also doing our Camp AmeriCorps. So all the, the 10 different AmeriCorps sites on Douglas County and Coos County will be spending the whole weekend at, at Steamboat Ball Field. So these young people who've been basically making uh, poverty wages for the last 11 months, it's their last weekend, and it's a big celebration. And all of them, all of those folks were impacted by the Archie Creek, uh, our AmeriCorps. Ryan Kincaid came here and was horrified. What am I getting myself into? The whole place is on fire. And to just uh, to see and to celebrate them, but also to give them some idea of, of what our community's up against and how we're going to be successful in, in moving together through the process. Yeah, yeah. I'm a huge fan of the AmeriCorps program. I, I think it's a great program. I've done a lot of work with them. and Yeah, that's great. Okay, Jeff. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it uh, to be our keynote speaker for this year's banquet. No problem. Thank you, Casey. I, I really appreciate it. And 
I really appreciate all the great work that Umpqua Watersheds does in you know in the Umpqua Basin, and just keep it up. Okay, buddy. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Hazy. Have a good night. You too. So long. Right. Hello, I'm Ken Carloni. I'm the president of Umpqua Watersheds. You've seen a lot of great presentations in this virtual banquet from our staff and board members. But I'd like to say a few words about the year that was and also introduce our board members and our executive director. 2020 was a challenging year as it was for most of us, but Umpqua Watersheds not only survived, we thrived. Thanks to the dedication of our board and staff and thanks in large part to all of you who stepped up and donated your hard earned cash to make up for our traditional fundraisers that got shut down due to the pandemic. But with vaccination rates rising, we hope to see you in person at River Appreciation Day for hikes and at the 2021 Brewfest. Speaking of dedicated board members, I'd like to introduce them to you, some new and some old timers and I'll start with the oldest old timer first, and that would be me. I'm gonna cheat here a bit and put up uh, pictures and bios from the Umpqua Watersheds webpage. And um, um, I am a founding member of the organization uh, and uh, have, uh, have been with uh, Watersheds uh, since the beginning, I did take a bit of a hiatus in the early 2000s, um, but I was uh, a president from 96 to 98, again in 2009 to 2013, and it says here in the bio, 2019 to 2021, which means that my term is about to come to an end. And uh, you'll need to stay tuned to find out who the next uh, president of Lumqua Watersheds is going to be. Uh, currently, I am also uh, chairing the Restoration Committee, and since I retired from Umpqua Community College, I have been uh, throwing myself into restoration ecology, spending time on the board of the Umpqua Oak Partnership, and especially on the board of the U Creek Land Alliance that I spoke of just a little bit in my uh, roundup of restoration activities. There we've been doing a lot of oak restoration and um, more uh, of, of great interest to me, uh, we've been taking the slash that we create from that project and converting it to biochar. So I have um, uh, really taken the bull by the horns where uh, biochar and the, and the the process of biocharring is concerned, and I've been doing uh, workshops and consulting in that regard. So um, I've been uh, uh, I've been staying busy, and I will be uh, seeing all of you out in the field or out and about soon. Janice Reed is our vice president. She's recently retired from the Forest Service and is the foremost authority on spotted owl biology in southwestern Oregon. She's been a longtime supporter of Umpqua Watersheds and after retiring has now joined the board, which is awesome. Until recently, Janice has been our outreach chair and has been our newsletter editor and is a driving force with KQUA, Umpqua Watersheds low power FM radio station in fact, she's just started a new weekly music program, Earth in Tune, focused on river-themed and environmentally attuned music. She's also put a tremendous amount of effort into upgrading our building. She has a strong interest in field education and is an advocate for getting kids and adults into the woods to experience nature close up we also appreciate the knowledge and energy she brings to our board, and I look forward to more great things from Janice. So Janice, thanks from all of us. 
Diana Pace is our secretary and has spent a lot of time working with the Wilderness Committee. Um, Diana is, uh, has, is not only a super reliable secretary and board member, but she also is uh, in the leadership of the Friends of the Umpqua, the hiking group that many of you know uh, from the area here. She's an avid hiker, an avid outdoors person. She's organized and led lots of hikes. And uh, she has just a um, wonderful personality and has been um, a just a super uh, part of our board. And we really enjoy spending time with her. And uh, we think that she really makes the board a more uh, a more congenial group. So so my heartfelt thanks to to Diana Pace. Although a longtime supporter of Umpqua Watersheds, Mark Eason has recently joined the board of directors and we really appreciate his background in uh, in financial and legal aspects. Um, he's been a great help uh, renovating our solid but uh, aging building that has needed some updates. And Mark has really uh, put in the effort there to, to bring the building up to standards. He has a deep experience with uh, contracting with agencies over several decades. And he's also a member of the U Creek Land Alliance Board and uh, was involved in all phases of our restoration and biochar project out there um, over the last uh, couple of years. So uh, Mark has brought a, a range and depth of experience to the board that we really, really appreciate. And we don't know we don't know how we got along without him before. So Mark, thank you personally and for the whole board. Eric Stouter is the youngest uh, member of our board. He brings that uh, perspective to the board, which uh, had uh, unfortunately been lacking up until uh, he arrived. So we're, we're glad to have the perspective of a younger person on the board. I met Eric uh, several years ago when he walked into my office at UCC and wanted to know more about the Natural Resources Program. And since that time, I've uh, I've been a uh, professor to Eric, uh, but that has grown into a friendship now that I really cherish. Eric is uh, super dedicated uh, to the mission of Umqua Watersheds. He also is uh, now leading the uh, education committee, uh, and he has a a, a special perch there to work from because he also uh, is the Youth Conservation Corps coordinator at the Phoenix Charter School. Uh, Eric actually was one of our learn, earn, and serve students uh, on the youth crews that we uh, had put together in the past at Umqua Watersheds to, to put students to work in the woods under the supervision of of biologists and agency uh, personnel. And Eric uh, really took off, really thrived in that environment. And he's just about to finish up his bachelor's degree uh, at uh, Oregon State University and probably going to move on to a graduate degree there as well. So uh, he's, uh, he's a, a, a strong advocate of, of collaborative uh, work and also getting youth out into the woods to experience nature on experiencing nature on their own and hopefully put them on a on a similar pathway to the one that he's traveling now from Phoenix School to UCC and on to OSU or another institution of higher education so Eric has been um, 
uh, an invaluable addition to the board and a fresh perspective that uh, some of us old timers really enjoy. And I want to thank Eric for his uh, participation and look forward to uh, working a whole bunch more with him in the future. Tony Cannon is our newest board member. He started uh, a while back um, coming to Wilderness Committee meetings and little by little, little he got more and more uh, involved in Umpqua Watersheds and, um, and uh, a couple of months ago he joined the board, which we're very thankful for. I met Tony on a hike to the North Umpqua Arch where I got a chance to chat with him and his delightful daughter while we were hiking. I learned that Tony is quite an explorer, finding hidden caves and waterfalls in remote areas. And recently he shared some of his secrets during a webinar he led um, through Umpqua Watersheds uh, on the use of LIDAR imagery to be able to look below the trees to find these hidden treasures. I look forward to working uh, with and learning more from Tony in the future. So Tony, thanks for stepping up. Last, but definitely not least, I'd like to introduce our executive director, Casey Hovick. Casey joined the Umqua Watersheds board in 2012 and in 2017, uh, stepped off the board to become our executive director. In these last four years, Casey has put in a tremendous amount of effort keeping the many moving parts of our organization meshing efficiently. He has a master's degree in business administration and another in environmental law and policy, which he puts to good use supervising our office staff and our AmeriCorps member. Uh, he. Uh, has a passion for education and has been involved with Umpqua Watersheds education initiatives throughout his tenure at UW. He's also a board member of the Partnership for Umpqua Rivers, another nonprofit organization in Roseburg, and will soon take on the presidency of that organization. And on top of that, he's also Umpqua Watersheds outreach chair uh, he produces the Watersheds Moments email updates that you receive in your email box and is very involved in organizing KQUA, our radio station. He does the Outback concerts uh, out behind our building that many of you have attended and uh, all of uh, our other uh, public events and outreach efforts. So to Casey Hovick, uh, we say thank you so much, and we're looking forward to another great year. I've really enjoyed working with all of these folks. You couldn't ask for a better group of, of people to put your shoulder to the wheel with. Um, the board is a bit small right now, but everybody steps up and pitches in when things need to get done, and I really ap appreciate the professional, respectful, and, and frankly, fun environment we all create for each other. I couldn't be prouder of the work we all do together for the community and the environment, uh, but we need a few more board members to meet the challenges ahead and to lighten our loads so that we can all avoid burnout. So if you've been thinking about joining the Umqua Watersheds board, all you need is a good attitude, a willingness to roll up your sleeves, and an earnest desire to save the world. So contact any of us if you're interested in joining our team. And thank you so much for attending our virtual banquet, and may the forest be with you.